Uh, so hi everyone, welcome to the UACGS event where we're going to be able to teach you a little bit more about what geotechnical and geovironmental engineering is. Um, so first we'll just give you a little introduction on what our student group is. Um, so we are a student chapter of the Canadian Geotechnical Society and our mission for you is to be able to provide you more networking opportunities and to create a more sustained and uh, more connected network of geotechnical and geovironmental engineers. Uh, so we know as undergrads, you guys might not have a lot of exposure to the geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering fields. So we're here to kind of bridge the gap of information between the undergraduate students and industry. Uh, so we want you guys to be a part of our uh, a part of our group here. And so we're going to try and start doing that for you guys tonight by uh, bringing you two incredible industry professionals who will be teaching you a little bit more about what they do on a daily basis and what your careers might look like as geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineers. Uh, so just a little bit more information about us. Uh, Fernanda will be putting links to our website um, and also our weekly newsletters in the chat box if you guys would like to subscribe and learn a little bit more about us and our upcoming events. Um, so Fernanda will have that information for you today. Uh, and I believe our first presenter today will be Nicole. Uh, so I'll just introduce you guys to Nicole here. Uh, so Nicole is a senior geotechnical engineer at WSP and has been involved in multiple major urban highway projects in the greater Toronto area. Numerous civil infrastructure projects in Ontario and Alberta, as well as geohazard projects within the nation, National Parks of Canada and Alberta, and also mining projects in Alberta and the Dominican Republic. Uh, Nicole completed her undergraduate and master's at the University of Toronto and her doctorate at Hokkaido University in Japan. So we'll give a big welcome to Nicole and we'll let her start her presentation on geotechnical engineering. Thanks, Gabriela. Um, I hope everybody can hear me good. I was having a bit of computer issues before. Um, I'm actually going to stop my video just because it's going to be a little bit better for uh, presentation. So, and then let's share this. Okay. Can everybody see? Hello? No. Uh, no, not yet. Sorry about that. How about now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. One thing. Yeah, it's computers. They're not my greatest thing. Okay, so if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Oh, that kind of went fast. Um, so I'm here to kind of talk to you about what is geotechnical engineering. Um, I tried to kind of take um, a step back, trying not to go into too much detail. Um, but if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Okay, so geotechnical engineering, it's a branch of civil engineering. It's um, also known as geotechnics, and it's concerned with the engineering behavior of earth materials. So that's our soil and our rock. It basically deals with everything that's underground or below the ground surface. We rely heavily on the knowledge of geology, hydrology, geophysics, and other related sciences, and we work hand in hand with other disciplines. So like our environmental engineers, um, that's where we get some of the geoenvironmental, which is gonna be talked about later. So in essence, we're actually just soil and, and rock engineers. Um, anybody that likes to play with dirt, geotech's a great field for you. So the definition based on the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering um, is quite long-winded, but it basically says that. Um, it's a science that explains mechanics of soil and rock and its application to development of humankind. It includes without being limited to the analysis and design and construction of various things that we're gonna talk about today. So a brief history, just because it's good to know how we came about um, with geotechnical engineering. Um, it is part of civil engineering, which is one of the oldest professions. At first, geotechnical engineering was applied through trial and error, observation, empirical exper experimentation. They didn't know much about soil and rock back then. It was more, hey, let's build this. Is it going to fall down or not? Some of the earliest examples are the dikes, dams, and canals from ancient Egypt or ancient Mesop Mesopotamia. So here, this is a picture of what the world's first irrigation system might have looked like. Um, and basically they dug trenches and river um, banks in order to bring the water to the fields where they would grow their crops. 
And in order to protect the fields from the floods, they built these dikes and that's where geotech comes in, right? Because we wanna make sure that those dikes don't fail so that earth stays where it's supposed to stay and the water stays on the other side and not where the villages were. Another example is Machu Picchu. Um, Machu Picchu represents civil engineering and environmental design in harmony with its environment. It's a great civil engineering accomplishment. Um, from a geotechnical perspective, I mean, there's tons here. We've got site preparations. We've got all of this foundation engineering, right? So to build the buildings, right? What is it founded on? But one of the greatest things is um, slope stabilization. So there's actually an ancient light slide, which I didn't know about. Um, and in order to build this civilization here, or this city in a way, um, they actually built hundreds of terraces all throughout Machu Picchu in order to keep the ground from falling away, right? So it stays where it is. We still use um, this type of uh, slope stabilization today. I mean, it's, it looks maybe a little bit um, more sophisticated these days, but it's essentially the same. It's terraces on large slopes, just to make sure that we're not looking at one big slope, but tiny uh, little ones. Um, another not so great example is um, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So this, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was um, initially constructed or started construction in 1173. Um, and as soon as construction started, you could see that um, the tower started leaning. And this is because of the soft ground conditions below the tower. So that meant, meant the soft ground could not hold the leaning tower straight. Um, and over the course of time, I mean, in the beginning, they didn't understand this. So they actually started making the columns on the leaning side taller. So that added more weight, which ended up causing the tower to lean a bit more. And by about 1990, um, the tower had a lean of about five and a half degrees and it was very close to falling over. So what they did, um, they used counterweights on the other side to try and get um, the other side to set a little bit more. Um, they also stuck uh, concrete beneath the ground surface, right? Just to make that soft ground less soft, right? It's just to harden it up and that's um, ground improvement. And eventually they actually went in and they dug up a whole bunch of the dirt from beneath just to make sure that it leans the other way. So now it's got a tilt of about four degrees. So this was kind of an example of why we need geotechnical engineering. This was a trial and error and it went badly. So between the 1700s and the 1900s, um, you see a more scientific approach. And this is where you get publications from Coulomb, Darcy, Rankin, Boussinesque, Moore, Atterberg. And these are all names that if you study soil mechanics, you're gonna come across, um, they're quite big. Um, you also have, um, in 1925, Carl Charles Zaghi, who's the father of soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering, he published his book, Erdbaum Mechanic, um, and that kind of changed the face of geotechnical engineering. Uh, so, um, geotechnical engineering, it's everywhere. I mean, you might not know it, but everything is supported by either soil or rock. What's not supported by soil or rock either floats, flies, or falls down. And I mean, that's not a great picture of falling down, but you guys get the idea. So within geotechnical engineering, we've got a number of specialties or um, aspects, right? And some of which rely heavily on other disciplines such as environmental engineering, that's our landfills. Um, but we've got transportation, foundations, deep excavations, and so on. Um, we're not gonna look at all of them just because 20 minutes would not be enough to look at everything. Um, but we're just gonna touch on a couple with some examples just to give you an idea of, of what geotechs do. So geotechnical engineers are responsible um, to ensure that our roads, highways, and railways are properly designed and maintained to ensure their longevity. So when we look at transportation, I mean, you see on the left-hand side, I don't know if you guys can see my arrow, but this is the Anthony Hende. To construct this, geotechnical engineers have to be involved with the road surface, right? So we're dealing with anything below the actual roads. Um, can it sustain the traffic, right? Will it settle? We're dealing with the pavement itself. Um, geotechs are also dealing with these slopes, right? So the embankments, we wanna make sure that settlement doesn't happen here. So we don't get leaning tower of Pisa um, type happening. We wanna make sure that those slopes stay where they are. When we look at the bridges, we're looking at foundations, right? So we wanna make sure that uh, we design the bridges according to the soil conditions there, right? So if there's soft ground, we might have to do um, deeper foundations. If it's, if it's 
bedrock, we're going to do shallow foundations. Um, with our embankments, um, so when we were looking at um, settlement, we're also looking at, um, you know, if there's settlement, we might have lightweight fill. So that's this picture on the, the right side. Um, instead of putting earth, we're going to put something that weighs next to nothing so that there is no settlement, there is no additional weight being placed on that soil. When we look at rail, we're looking at almost exactly the same things as when we look at highways or roads, we're looking at embankments, we're looking at bridges. Um, with rail, it's a little bit different just because um, our, our rail, rail system can't take that much settlement. So on roads, I mean, we have some settlement, um, we can kind of deal with it, right? Cars, I mean, you might get potholes and whatnot eventually. So cars are kind of used to that. But with the trains, just because they are on the tracks, you can't have that settlement. It'll cause derailments. For foundations, um, we have shallow and deep foundations, right? So houses are typically, or any lightweight structure, it's typically built on a shallow foundation. So that's basically um, anything that's, I think, um, it's above 3.5 meters. Um, anything that's heavier, uh, like a, a, a structure, any of your high rises, they're going to be on deep foundations, just because that load can be transferred over a larger volume of soil, right? Or it can be transferred to a more competent strata, right? So if you've got like soft clay, so that's you're going to have your Play-Doh style um, soil strata up above and below you have bedrock, you want to actually put the loads of that structure onto your bedrock. So an excellent example of um, the use of deep foundations is the Khalifa Tower. This is the tallest structure and building in the world since I think 2009. Um, and so we see it's, it's huge. I mean, look at the high rises next to it. What's really cool about it from a geotechnical engineering perspective are the foundations, right? You have this, this, this huge um, raft foundation. It's 3.7 meters thick concrete. And below it, you've got, I think, what was it, 192 piles. Um, so that means that the load from this, this heavy structure is spread out across um, 192 piles that go down deep. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool design from a geotechnical perspective. Um, we also have deep excavations, right? So basically, um, anytime you want to build in an urban area, you probably don't have a lot of room. Um, if you're, say, out on the beach and you, you start making a, a hole in the sand, you see that at some point that sand starts caving in. So the same thing happens with any type of material. At some point, it'll start caving in. You can't really put a vertical face. So you have to do a slope. But in urban areas, we don't have that opportunity. We don't have the room. Um, if we have, I don't know, a 50 meter deep excavation, you will not have enough room. You, you need about 100 meters, if not more, um, of, of your slopes, right, to go into the excavation. So what we have is shoring. Um, and there's different types. I mean, here on the picture on the left-hand side, we have concrete. Right, so basically there's tubes of concrete that are, are put in and, and becomes a wall. Here we've got soil nails. Um, again, that's there's nails in behind and there's a concrete face on top. Here we've got sheet piles. Um, this right picture, it's not quite a deep excavation, but it's for any pipeline. If you don't wanna build um, anything too fancy, you can put in a trench box. Um, but geotechnical engineers are involved with this just because we need to know well, what kind of pressure is going in, what's the water condition, right? How, what, what type of shoring do we need in order for that soil to stay where it is? And so these workers down here are safe. Um, a favorite of mine is tunneling. Um, so basically this is anything from tiny little water mains, right? So if you've got, um, again, if you're in an urban area, you can't um, cut, a, cut a hole open in, in to your surface, right? You need to put something underground. So trenchless technology. So it can be a tiny little um, boring or it could be huge, like some of the subways that we're now building. Um, Japan's really known for this just because, I mean, there's, there's nowhere to go in Japan. You gotta go underground. Um, so with tunneling, um, it's very complicated uh, just because of, again, the ground conditions, right? You can deal with clays, you can deal with sands, you can deal with rock, you can deal with all of it in one hole. 
right? You need to know, well, when you make that hole, how will it stand up? What's going to come in? If it's uh, sand with water, right? You, you start digging at it. And again, think of your sand or your beach example, that sand is going to start coming into your, your tunnel. Um, there's also various technologies out there, right? So up in the left-hand corner, that's an earth pressure balance machine. Um, down here, I think that might be a jack and bore. I'm not quite sure. We've got tiny little tunnels. Um, and you know what? People still go out and they do hand digging. Um, so that's, a, a, it depends on your soil conditions again. We've also got dams and embankments. So geotechnical engineers are responsible for the design, construction, and monitoring of thousands of dams, right? And these are for water, but they're also for mine tailings, right? So down um, on the right, we've got a tailings dam. Um, and you've heard that, um, I mean, there's been tons of failures. And when this happens, anything below is kind of at risk. So it's up to us to make sure that those dams are designed safely. And that's, again, um, slope stability issue. Um, it is a settlement issue, right? Because if you've got settlement, it's going to cave in and so forth. Um, up in the right-hand corner, I mean, that looks like an earth earth dam, right? It kind of failed right through. And you see that um, part of the roadway gave out. Out here on the left-hand side, I mean, this is uh, just water, but you see some um, slope stability issues that kind of caused the whole thing to fail. And that looks like it used to be rock maybe. Um, so we have to look at the rock properties, right? If it's, if it's crappy rock, then of course it's not gonna hold up. Um, we've also got a ground improvement. So this is what happened at the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? They, um, they had soft ground conditions. They kept on settling. They, so they started pumping in concrete, right? Just to harden up that ground. So they had clay underneath. It's kind of like Play-Doh. So they stuck in a whole bunch of concrete and that should have kept it from settling more. Um, ground improvement methods are really used um, when there's nothing else we can do, right? So if we've got say a meter of shitty soil, then I mean, we're gonna go in and excavate it, that's fine. But if you've got 10 meters of it or 20 meters, or if you've got um, like a bad soil layer at depth, you're not gonna go in and excavate, it's too expensive. It's just, it's not safe either. So you're gonna do a ground improvement method. And this is basically you make the existing bad soil better. And there's various methods depending on um, what you need um, and what's down there, right? So you can do a compaction, right? So if you take, um, I don't know, I can't really think right now, <laughs> sorry. Um, basically, if you're just compacting away, you take a hammer at something, I mean, obviously you're gonna, you're gonna make it harder. Um, you could do drains, right? So anything where you've got silts and clays, you can take the water out because the water is what causes it to be kind of be mushy. Um, you can push concrete in. Um, so there's various methods. Um, and then you've also got geohazards. So this is more on the natural side. Um, you've got earthquakes, landslides, rockfalls, debris flows, um, and so forth. I've kind of just pushed it all in one. Um, for landslides, I mean, you are looking at anything ancient landslides. So up here on the left-hand side, I mean, they build a town. Um, and just based on that geology, based on what we're seeing, the landforms, they should have kind of figured that, hey, that might kind of start caving in at one day, at one point. So it is without touching what's already out there, we have to look at, is it safe or not? Other areas are just say up here on the right, you've got that slope that failed um, along the road and same thing down here. So this, the slope might have been fine before we touched it, but then we go in and we change the conditions, right? We built something on it, we're, we're changing the ground and we don't always take into account that, hey, that change might cause failures. Um, and you see this a lot um, and it's not necessarily because we've changed the ground, but in Alberta, in Edmonton, um, if you go out on the highways, I mean, you see these shallow slope failures everywhere, right? And that's just because the ground isn't that great up there. Um, we've also got these rock falls, right? And this is all along the parks. Um, we've, we've got huge rock faces, we've cut into them and naturally rock weathers away, right? So rock turns into soil at some point. And with time, with all the weather conditions, it just happens. Um, and when we, when we cut these faces, we need to keep monitoring to make sure that, hey, if there's something that's gonna come out, we kind of glue it back or we, we blast it out so that it, this doesn't happen, right? 
in the middle. It doesn't happen that basically if there was a car underneath, well, there isn't anymore. Um, down here on the right, um, we're looking at earthquakes. So this is from the J J Japan earthquake and tsunami, right? Uh, we have to look at um, if there is an earthquake, can anything that we design stay as it is, right? So if we've got foundations, what will the soil do at that point? Will it liquefy? Will those foundations stay where they are? Um, and then, so out of all of this, basically, what we see is that in geotech engineering, I mean, we, we work on a lot of cool projects. We work on some not so cool projects and they can be a little bit boring, but basically one of the most important things that we do is we characterize a site. So this is where like our, our bread and butter comes in. This is the most important part of geotech is that we go out, we do investigations or we take investigations that are already there. And we kind of say, we kind of draw a picture of this is what's happening underground. Right, so in this example, and I just took a random one, I mean, they've got gravel, um, they've got sand, they've got more sand, they've got this lower sand, I mean, you might have bedrock, but you kind of draw out a picture of what's going on there, what the water is, um, and you do lab testing so that you can say, okay, this sand is, is really competent, it's good, but whatever's on top is really not good. It's, it's a clay that's really soft and it's got to come out for what we need to do construct. Um, so this is kind of the most important part of geotech engineering is the site characterization, because if you get this wrong, it doesn't matter what you design, um, it's, it might, it's probably not going to work. So a couple of examples, are we good on time? Sorry, um, anybody? Yeah, keep going along, you're good. All right, sorry, I, I don't have any other screens on right now, so I can't see anything. <laughs> All right, so um, the Confederation Bridge, I don't know how many of you guys know it, but it's a 12.9 kilometer multi-span bridge that connects the PEI to New Brunswick. And it's considered to be one of the top five engineering achievements of the 20th century. And from a foundation's perspective, it's actually pretty cool. Um, it is the longest continuous marine span bridge over ice covered water in the world. So in terms of um, foundation engineering, I mean, if you look at it, everybody just sees what's on top, right? It's really pretty, but nobody thinks about what's beneath. Um, and if you think about it in this perspective, in this case, um, what's beneath is really important because, and one of those foundations fails, that pier goes, that bridge goes. So in this, um, in this scenario, there were quite a few challenges just because of the complex geology. Um, there was bedrock, right? So you think rock, it's really strong. Well, that's not true. Rock um, has various strength properties, right? So in this, in this scenario, there was variable strength bedrock. There was deep water. There's high and variable loads that are acting on here, right? So the structural engineers provide us the load, but we need to be aware of it as well. I mean, here you've got water, you've got wind, you've got ships. So if a ship actually hits um, one of these piers, then you know that impacts the foundations. But we've also got ice loads. So this is what it looks like in winter. So we got to take into account that ice. Um, in this case, there was also um, quite a bit of a challenge due to construction, just because there was such a short window because of the ice and because of the bad weather. So if you look here, I mean, on the left side, this is them constructing. They're out on a barge. They're creating basically these um, uh, coffer dams, which is just think of a deep foundation or, or a deep excavation, sorry, with shoring, and then you just pump all the water out. So that's what they're doing here. Um, and they have to do this. I mean, you can't do it when there's ice. You can't do it when it's cold, right? You need to do it when it's nice weather. If it's raining, you know what? It's going to be really hard. So here, um, these are the foundations on the right. Um, I guess if you're not used to the drawings, it might be a little hard to read, but this is everything that's above water. And this is everything below. So here you see sea level, you see this is about 35 meters long, and then there's bedrock. So they used circular rings and they used oval shaped rings. So the oval shaped was used were kind of, um, it was the deepest water where there was the most loading on, um, on, on the, the foundations, right? The circular rings were used everywhere else. Um, and they basically poured concrete. So they took out all the water, they put in these shapes and they poured concrete in there and they socketed into the bedrock. 
And this is what the Confederation Bridge is founded on. Um, another cool example is um, Kansai International Airport. So this is in Japan. Um, if you look at this, you think, oh, it's, it's you know, really cool, but how do they build this? Because um, as you guys may know, Japan doesn't have a lot of room. It's, it, there's a high population. Um, and this is actually a man-made island. They, um, this is what it looks like beneath, kind of above and beneath. So here you've got the alluvial clay, which basically is not so great clay. It's that Play-Doh, it's, you know, you put something on it, you put maybe a cup of water on it and it starts sinking. So here, this is where they had to do ground improvement, right? So this is, they put sand drains. So basically they mix sand with clay to make it stronger. They put more sand on top. And then they started building up this, this, um, this island. Um, they had to look at slope stability. They had to look at the effects of the water. Um, I'm sure there was some environmental engineering on there. And then they also had to look at the loads of these planes landing. And you might think, here, let me go back up. Like most of this is runway. This is all runway. This is all runway. And you think of the Boeing 787 or whatever they're called, they're heavy structures or they're heavy planes. And imagine when that plane lands, it's a huge impact, right? So if you drop a ball on concrete, nothing happens. But imagine dropping, I don't know how many tons this weighs on con like on a regular roadways, that pavement structure that will just go. But also what's underneath will settle. So they had to take all of that into account to make this airport. Um, and then that's it. I kind of tried to go over everything, um, just briefly touch on it. But if you guys have any questions, let me know. Perfect, thank you so much, Nicole. That was really interesting. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, attendees? <clears throat> I don't think we have any questions at this time, uh, but I have a few questions, uh, Nicole. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what the most rewarding thing is about your career. Uh, what do you think is the most rewarding thing about being a geotechnical engineer? Oh gosh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, honestly, um, I think it's seeing, I mean, so geotechnical engineers were brought in at the beginning of a project, right? Or we should be, sometimes it doesn't happen, but we're brought in, you know, somebody wants to design something, they want to design a building or they want to construct a road and we come in and, and we provide the information, but then we move on to other projects. We don't always see it through, um, especially some of the bigger ones, right? Um, but seeing it actually, if you're involved in a project where you see it from the design into construction, that's kind of rewarding. When you see that, you know, the retaining wall that you designed, um, that was super, um, it was very complex because of the water issues, because of, of the wildlife and whatnot. And when you actually see it being built and you see that it's standing, it's kind of like, wow that's pretty awesome, right? Because it's it's not, um, not every day do you see it, right? Um, I think in Alberta, um, a lot of the, the projects you are involved with, they, they do go, you do go from beginning to construction, right? Design, construction, everything. So that's kind of the rewarding part. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, I think we actually had somebody that raised their hand. So we'll let them ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Uh, I have a question like in regards to like, I guess international opportunities for geotechnical engineers. I know that like for a lot of engineering fields like regulations from like country to country, you know, they, they change and like, for example, like coming from Canada, you might not be able to work on something in a different country. Is geotechnical uh, engineering also an engineering field that, you know, that might be an issue if you, if you wanna work internationally? Uh, yes, because every single um, every single country has its own licensing, right? So I mean, we can't even work in the states. We can't sign off on anything in the states. Um, I mean, even in Canada, I've I have my what Ontario, Alberta, and Northwest Territory licenses. But if I want to go and be to work in Big C, I need to ask for that license, right? So it is a bit more complex. If you work for an international company, you do get to work on overseas projects, right? Um, you might not be the signing engineer. Um, so what, what does happen a lot is that we work, um, 
with a local engineering company. We provide some of the design, we provide some of the help, but they're the ones that end up having to stamp off on it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. No problem. Perfect. Do we have any other questions for Nicole? All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for today, but thank you so much for presenting. Uh, we really appreciate having all of your experience, uh, allowing the undergraduate students to see what a geotechnical engineer can do. So thank you so much. Anytime. All righty, so I think uh, we'll get on to our next presenter if we don't have any more questions. Uh, so our next presenter is Scott, um, and he currently works for Bar Engineering as a geoenvironmental specialist in their Calgary office. He has two years of experience with tailings and my waste management, primarily in Alberta's oil sands and Saskatchewan potash. Uh, so Scott earned his bachelor's degree in mining engineering from University of Alberta's uh, co-op engineering program in 2017. And he's currently working on completing his master's degree in geoenvironmental engineering. And his research has focused on evaluating novel dewatering techniques to improve the strength of fluid fine tailings in Alberta's oil sands. Uh, so welcome, Scott. Thank you, uh, Gab. And, uh... Thank you, Nicole, for your presentation. It was excellent, um, although a tough act to follow, a uh, very tough act to follow. Uh, mine is, my presentation um, is gonna be probably a little simpler, um, a little more of uh, kind of my personal experiences. Uh, I am a lot earlier in my career, so hopefully that'll give a bit of a unique perspective compared to uh, somebody who's a lot more experienced, such as Nicole. Um, so hopefully we can get a good breath from, from both of us for all of you. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I'm Scott, I'm going to talk about geoenvironmental engineering, um, and, uh, kind of give you guys a, a good understanding, hopefully by the time you walk away of what exactly geoenvironmental engineers might do, um, what the field is like and, and the types of careers. Um, it's very heavily related to geotechnical. So, um, Nicole's presentation was fantastic in that it, is gonna um, certainly give a good understanding of, of what it means to be a geotech. And then for me, I can kind of build off that a little bit. So um, I just wanted to start with a little bit more about me specifically so that if you do have any questions, you can kind of uh, use it as context. Um, I graduated in 2017. I started in 2012 at the U of A. Uh, my bachelor's is in mining rather than a civil degree, which is a bit different than most geotechnical or geoenvironmental engineers. Um, I was part of the co-op program, which means I did 20 months of work experience while doing that. Um, I spent eight months in Northeastern British Columbia for working for an engineering consultant doing materials testing. I spent four months operating a heavy haul truck at Syncrude in the oil sands. Uh, that's what that photo is and that's me in 2015. Um, and then I also spent eight months as a long range mine planner at Canadian Natural uh, Resources, which is uh, one of Canada's largest oil companies. Uh, doing mine planning for their Horizon Oil Sands mine. Uh, I graduated in 2017. While I was working at Canadian Natural, I realized um, that I was really interested in tailings um, and mine waste specifically. So dealing with uh, mine waste remediation, mine waste management, tailings management, and eventually reclamation and mine closure. Um, I realized that to really give myself the best opportunity possible, I needed more technical knowledge, so I decided to pursue a master's, um, which evolved into a geoenvironmental engineering master's, which I'm still working on completing my thesis in. Um, I got hired by BAR in January of 2019. It started in August of 2019 uh, when I relocated to Calgary permanently, which is where I am now. So that's a little about me. Feel free to ask any questions at the end about this as well as what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but I'm going to move now into, you know, what is geoenvironmental engineering? And for me, this is one of my favorite graphics. It really shows how did geoenvironmental engineering come about? Um, geoengineer, geoenvironmental engineering is, is interestingly enough, a, a relatively new field as far as sciences go within the last decade. And it's, it's evolved from a greater focus on, you know, how do these industrial projects and and commercial things and mines 
what are those impacts to the communities that they are placed in, to health, to the environment. So this definition that I pulled from GeoEngineer is, is one of my favorites because it's, it is still technical, but to me, the most important thing about a geoenvironmental engineer is that highlighted part, which is, you know, yes, we can build that mine, we can build that structure, we can build that dam, but what is the impact of building that on whether not just human health, but also the environment? How does it impact, um, you know, fish habitat? How does it impact, um, the, you know, the diversity of, of the ecology of that area? So geoengineering really aims to address, you know, the geotechnical engineering problems in the context of the environmental impacts. So to me, that's what really got me interested in it because I ended up being supremely interested in tailings and mine waste. And we all know that mining has a massive impact on, on the environment as well as the communities where mines are placed. And, and a lot of it is not positive. So geoenvironmental engineering to me is really about finding a way to allow that industry and those industries to exist without, you know, doing un unnecessary or irreparable harm to either the communities that they're in or the environment. Um, something that I kind of like to say is that, you know, geoenvironmental engineers, we're resolving the past, we're managing the present, and we're trying to protect the future. Um, and it's important to note that responsible development is, it's about more than just, you know, one specific facet of environmental protection. It includes involving communities, it involves meeting regulations. It involves now more than ever getting good information to the public so that the public understands what you're doing and what the impacts are and why this project is, is worth proceeding with. So, you know, everything we do, everything we extract, the phone, the computer you're on right now, your vehicle, even all of the new green technologies, they all have a cost because of almost everything has to come to begin with from some sort of mining or, or large industrial type um, thing that can have significant waste implications. So geoenvironmental engineering, like I said, is really about how do we manage that waste? How do we manage those negative impacts of our industries so that we can continue to have what we're fortunate enough to have without destroying or annihilating, you know, the environment or the people that have called where we want to open these things you know, home. For me, I just wanted to say that there's a small bias. I do work primarily in mining. Um, so most of my talk will focus on that sort of tailings and mine waste and reclamation type problems. But it's important to note that geoenvironmental engineering is heavily into things like landfills, contaminant transport, remediation. And those are beyond just mining. That's any industrial site. All you have to do is type in Superfund um, and you'll get a slew of all the ecological disasters caused by industry in the United States specifically, and there's plenty in Canada as well. Um, so I, that's kind of my little spiel about geoenvironmental engineering. Um, again, any questions at the end, happy to answer. Um, I thought it might be valuable to kind of talk about what, uh, you know, a career could look like because there's so many different things that a geoenvironmental engineer can do. And a lot of it looks very similar to um, geotechnical engineers and other civil type engineers. Uh, we work on dams, we work on mine waste tailing, mine closure reclamation, contaminated sites, groundwater management and protection, water treatment. If something is going to have a potential impact to the surrounding environment or the people, a geoenvironmental engineer is going to probably have the best set of skills to, to take advantage of that. And as I said, geoenvironmental is a new field in regards to the, you know, the, the length of time. It's been, it's counted in a few decades rather than centuries. And because of that, that's, that has become more and more prevalent that we have a need for, for geoenvironmental engineers because the public is demanding more, governments and regulators are demanding more, and we should also be demanding more of ourselves. We should understand that there should be a better way to do things. So geoenvironmental engineers are gonna work, you might find them literally anywhere. Um, you're going to see them most heavily in mining, in oil and gas, and in heavy manufacturing, but they're also going to be involved in public infrastructure and all those sort of construction projects because, you know, many people might associate a mine or a, or a refinery with an environmental impact, but they don't often think of what's the environmental impact of that 
road overpass or that bridge or what is going to be the impact of building that structure or that project in that area and how do we mitigate that or prevent it or if we can't you know how do we put it back to how it was before so it's less concerned with are we able to do it and more with what is the implications of that and how do we fix it manage it prevent it from doing unnecessary harm um, i wanted to talk a little more too just about the roles that we fill uh, to me there's kind of five kind of paths you can end up in as a this is true for really any engineer where you'll have the principal owner or an operator such as a large oil company or a, or a municipal government um, and they're the people that want something done and then a contractor would be more like a construction company and they're going to be the ones who who really put boots and equipment on the ground and are going to actually build it um, consultants such as myself and nicole um, we're meant to be the technical expertise the technical experts um, kind of provide that guidance either to another consultant or engineering company or to the contractor or operator and act in a capacity where we can provide our knowledge to ensure a project is built safely and according to the way something is designed. Of course, there's also government and regulators. So that's dealing with permitting and managing these projects in regards to getting permission to build a mine, getting permission to build a structure, getting permission to um, impact that uh, water body or that river. And then finally, as, as a professor or researcher, you could end up at a university, um, you know, trying to be on the cutting edge of these sort of things. So that's basically where I see geoenvironmental engineers, but there's really no end to where you could end up, um, not just physically, but also in terms of industry. Um, I thought I'd just mention my thesis work, which is on using native plant species to dewater oil sands tailings. I'm not gonna to go too in depth with it. It is focused on the geotechnical characteristics, which is basically how do these plants improve the strength of these tailings? Because in the oil sands, we have massive quantities of extremely soft, very weak um, tailings that are essentially the consistency of chocolate milk. And because of the, you know, I'm not gonna get into the depths of clay behavior and stuff because it'll probably bore the pants off you, but it's actually fascinating because it's extremely complex. And um, getting the water out of that material is extremely difficult in terms of if you just let it sit there, it would take centuries for the clays to come out. So what we do with this sort of research that I'm doing um, is really how do we get it stronger, faster? How do we get the water out so we can have improved geotechnical strength so that we can reclaim these tailings ponds and, and walk away from these mine sites and the oil sands, for example, which is what this is for, um, in a positive way and leave it better or the same as we found it. Um, turning to myself personally at BAR, um, my title is Geoenvironmental Specialist. I work mostly on oil sands and potash tailings and dams, but I also do work with groundwater management and other mining projects. Um, like I said, I'm heavily into mining. Um, the last couple of weeks, I was first, I was for a week, I was in the mountains of the Crow's Nest Pass in Alberta at a coal mine. And then I spent the last 10 days up in the oil sands on another project doing a tailings technology trial. Um, so that also kind of speaks to what my typical day is. And, and for me, I'm also a young consultant. So being in the field is more common as you become more senior and, and gain more knowledge, you're gonna spend less time in the field in general, not always. Um, so for me, when I, you know, I'm asked to talk about my typical day, I don't really have one, although I have one kind of in the field or in the office and in the summer when the weather's good, um, I'm constantly in the field and my field tasks can be very unique. I can be collecting data, collecting samples, uh, providing quality control, which is really just construction oversight. So making sure that something is being built to the, the design so that it's safe and it, and it meets the expectations of the designer. Um, and those are the sort of things I've been doing. I do a lot with novel approaches to tailings technologies, similar to my research, but I do them for industry as a representative of BAR, which is what I was doing in the oil sands last 10 days. Um, I'd love to be able to show you more of my projects. Unfortunately, um, most of the things I work on are confidential and protected. Um, and as a result, I'm not able to share details and photos, but I can tell you it's if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's extremely exciting to be a part of 
trying to find solutions to you know some of these big environmental challenges. Um, so I thought I'd just show some project examples and these are all biased heavily towards mining just because again that's mostly where I work but again your environmental engineers are going to be heavily involved with landfills they're going to be involved with municipal projects you can really work in whatever industry that you want and kind of wherever you want like for me I have projects like I said I focus mainly in BC Alberta and Saskatchewan but I've also had opportunities throughout the US to work um, we have projects in South America the Middle East Russia and northern Canada as well so and this is true for geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering. This is this is a problem that everyone has. These are challenges that everyone needs to solve. So, in terms of that ability to work elsewhere, those opportunities are certainly there. So, I just wanted to show some examples because I don't think people understand that when you get environmental and geoenvironmental engineers and geotechnical engineers and ecologists and scientists involved from the get-go in things like mining reclamation, it's amazing the things you can do. And the impact of having a positive reclamation or final result can be the difference between your next project and not. So this is one of my favorites. It's the Lady of the North. It's in the United Kingdom. This is actually a reclaimed coal mine waste pile. And this is a very famous one because the coal company decided we're not just going to do the bare minimum. We're going to consult with communities, find out what they want. How can we add value? to the community, because this is something that a lot of people misunderstand. Reclamation does not always mean restoration. It can, and it often does, but reclamation is generally make it valuable, make it so it's not having a negative impact on the community. So this is now a tourist attraction that generates income for that community. And because of this, they got approved for another mine in the future. And that's why it's so important to do this right from the get-go, not just from a personal or moral or regulatory standpoint, but even if you're only gonna look at it in terms of business, doing this thing right the first time will make it easier the next time. This is also in the UK in Cornwall. This is an old quarry that's been repurposed into this tourist attraction, um, very similar. Just Google the Eden project and it'll show up. These are just big biomes and this is a resort. So there's so many things you can do. Uh, this is one in Alberta. This is uh, the reclaimed, this is an end pit lake at Cardinal River, which is a now closed coal mine in Hinton, Alberta, which is a few hours west of Edmonton. And this actually supports species. So there's trout and fish in that lake that are able to repopulate and, and have a healthy ecological community through that and through that stream. So this is evidence of you know, what else we can do when we're reclaiming a mine, it doesn't have to be, we don't need to follow the sins of the past. You know, we're all, we're still cleaning up the mistakes and the greed and the, and the issues with not doing things properly. But this just shows that when you do put in the effort, there's some pretty amazing things we can do. Um, and I just wanted to, my last slide here is uh, an example in the oil sands because I know the oil sands can be a pretty hot topic right now. Um, this is an example of reclamation that occurred at Suncor's base mine in Pond 5. It's now called Wapasu Lookout. And this is an example of what can be achieved. So this is a tailings pond, Pond 5. This is it during its reclamation process. And this is as it stands today. And I fly over it frequently, so I know that this is still how it looks. But there's an important lesson to learn from this. This project was exceedingly expensive because they did it in a few years. But if you do what's called progressive reclamation, which means you reclaim as you mine, as you're making the money, you're doing the reclamation so that you don't end up at the end with a big bill or going bankrupt or leaving a mess for the government or taxpayers or the community to clean up. It's important to plan for this from the start. And that's what I'm passionate about and what I love about this industry. So this is an example of what we're capable of we shouldn't be hopeless, we should be hopeful. And uh, I just wanted to end with this quote, which I really like, which is, it is not only for what we do that we are held responsible, but also for what we do not do. And that's something that I think all engineers should uh, keep in mind with, with everything they do. And uh, yeah, that's all, so questions. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Scott. That was a great presentation. Uh, do any of the uh, attendees have questions? I think we have somebody raising their hand. Hi, can I ask a question? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was just wondering, like, for Scott, like, what chose you to pick, like, a Master of Science and an MEng? Is there any particular, like, thing that you like? Just the thesis is more critical from what you were thinking for tail and ponds, or you're not into, like, a course-based? Uh, I actually started in a course-based program. Um, might have been better at this point, because <laughs> I would have finished. Um, in terms of value in industry, I would say that there is not going to be a significant difference between the two in terms of the letters that will go beside your name. If you're going to stay in academia, then there is some impact because there is no thesis. So if you were, for example, wanting to do a PhD, an MSc is generally going to prepare you in a better way. Although I'm not a PhD, so we do have those who are here and they would obviously be much better to speak than me. Um, what happened for me though, is I was offered the opportunity from my supervisor, who's Nicholas Beyer. Um, he's, he was looking for somebody who was familiar with the oil sands, familiar with mining to be uh, a part of, to join one of his projects. And at that point in time, I, I decided, you know what, I don't have anything right now. I didn't have a job lined up at that point. And I decided this will be a good opportunity for me because I wanted to drill a little deeper. So it really is a personal preference. But if you are planning on going into industry, don't think you're going to be at a disadvantage with an MNG over an MSC. Um, most industry will have no idea what the difference is, and that's perfectly okay. Um, for me, it was really just a personal, it was an opportunity that I decided to take. Now, for me, it's been a massive deal because I learned a ton while doing my research. And the reality is, too, every time I complain about my master's, I kind of have to Eat my, eat my words a little bit because the reason I have a job at Bar is while I was conducting my research at one of my oil sand sites, I met somebody from Bar who then asked for my resume and passed that on to their team. And that's kind of how I ended up at Bar. So, which is a fantastic place to work and I'm working on things I'm passionate about and I couldn't be happier. So every time I want to uh, quit or say I shouldn't have done it, I'm reminded that I wouldn't be where I am without it. So I hope that answers your question. I know it was a little wordy. Um, if you have, if it didn't, please let me know. But hopefully that, that answered it okay. Yeah, I think it did answer it pretty good. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, thank you for that question. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Scott? Uh, if not, I have one quick question for Scott. Uh, I know that geoenvironmental engineering isn't really well known, uh, so I know if I was looking for a career in geoenvironmental engineering, I really wouldn't know where to start on how to kind of get started in that career. Uh, so do you have any advice for undergraduate students who are interested in starting careers in geoenvironmental engineering? Um, I think the place to start is, is don't you is is that initial graphic that I showed where Geoenvironmental is the intersection of geotechnical groundwater and environmental engineering, which it truly is. You're generally not going to see a job posting for geoenvironmental engineers because it is so new. But you can apply for geotechnical jobs as well as environmental jobs, as long as you're open and honest about what your knowledge base is, what your background is. For me, I do a lot of geotechnical work still, but my knowledge and my technical background was mainly geotechnical focus with a little bit more environmental, especially around tailings and mine waste. But I lack knowledge in something like trenchless construction, which, which Nicole talked about, and, and because those are courses I didn't need to take. Um, so it's really about read the job postings and see if that's something that you're interested in, especially as an entry-level engineer. This is true for any discipline where if it's something that's interesting to you, and that you have at least a base knowledge in, it's worth applying because you're an entry level person and the company expects you to be. So you need to join the company. For me, I think I applied to an environmental engineering position, but when you get there, they often will let you kind of blaze your own trail, especially if you're working for something like a consultant. Um, they want to sell you on your skills and help you grow. So 
for me, I've established myself as being more than an environmental engineer and something in between. So hopefully that's a reasonable answer. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Scott. All right, uh, any last minute questions for either Nicole or Scott? All right, well, I thank you both of us very, very much for being able to present for us today. Um, I hope that the undergraduate students were able to learn a lot more about each discipline and how you can kind of uh, get involved in each of these careers and see if you'd like to um, start your new career in geo-environmental or geotechnical.